now I've bested you, Morta, and Clan Nackmore will pay with blood. Okay, once again before I address this topic, I figured I'd go over some points people addressed about my previous one. The first one that struck me as very important and something that I missed that this person pointed out is the fact that the Oni Alpha Site Memorial in Halo 3 ODST says that Margaret Parangoski is dead. Now, we know that Halsey was also pointed out as dead, but she was at least believed to uh, be dead at this point because she was trapped on Onyx. But there's absolutely no reason why Parangoski should also be on the list of the dead. The Kilo 5 trilogy outright ignores the game listing her as dead, and this makes no sense. She wouldn't have needed to fake her death as Earth was the only place she had left to hide. And as Katarn276 also pointed out, this seems like a lazy way of having a leader for Oni from Travis so she could turn them into Cerberus 2.0. Also, uh, Rudra Mazumdar, sorry if I butchered that, also elaborated on some of the things I said regarding the Sangheili. Specifically with their warlike nature coupled with their feudal society, they would desperately need every single soldier they could get. Warriors are a valuable resource, and they couldn't possibly afford to waste them due to petty wounds. As Rudra said, treating wounds, infections, replacing maimed body parts not only gains the trust of the individual, but also gives others a reason to switch sides or clans and bring more force to a particular faction. This is also something I discussed with some people on Installation 00's Discord server, but with these things in mind, it's a wonder how the Sangheili reached the heights that they did. Sure, they were willing to let other species treat their wounds during their time with the Covenant, but considering that they were very advanced by the time of contact with the San Shayum in the War of Beginnings, I can't wrap my head around the idea of an incredibly advanced species of violent warriors sustaining a 100-year war with an even more advanced alien race and not losing far, far faster because they let all the warriors die from petty wounds. Now stand aside, worthy adversary. Tis but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off. No, it isn't. Well, what's that then? I've heard worse. One last thing before I start talking about our favorite toad people and some good old-fashioned genocide. There is a certain blog in particular I'd like to mention. The Halsey's Journal blog has a very, very good retrospective about Halsey and the way Karen Travis treated her, and much of the points I talked about in my previous video are covered in a way more concise and digestible manner, so I'll be linking that in the description. Anyways, on to the genophage and why I think curing it is bad. Okay, that is a volatile statement in and of itself, but allow me to get into the specifics. First of all, what does the genophage do exactly? Well, as the Mass Effect wiki says specifically, which I believe this is taken from the Codex, the genophage does not actually reduce the fertility of Krogan females, but rather the number of viable pregnancies. Though the genophage was not designed as a sterility plague, the combination of a low frequency of viable pregnancies with the Krogan proclivity to violence and indifference about focused breeding leaves the Krogan a dying race and soon to be extinct. Already, we can take away something from this, and that is that the reason the Krogan are dying is not because of the genophage, but because of themselves. Rex even states this in Mass Effect 1. Are your people really dying? We're sure not getting any stronger. We're too spread out. None of us are interested in staying in our own system. Lots of species have left their homes and prospered. But they go to colonize new worlds. We're not settlers. We're warriors. We want to fight. So we leave. Hire ourselves out. And most of us never go back. What can you tell me about the genophage? Ask the Salarians if you want details. They made it. All I know... It makes breeding nearly impossible. Thousands die in stillbirth, and most never get that far. Every Krogan is infected, every one. And no one's rushing to find a cure. Why don't the Krogan try to find a cure? When was the last time you saw a Krogan scientist? You ask a Krogan, would he rather find a cure for the genophage or fight for credits? They'll choose fighting every time. It's just who we are, Shepard. I can't change that. Nobody can. 
The Krogan continue to fight amongst themselves or sell themselves as bounty hunters and mercenaries across the galaxy, not only spreading their numbers thinner and thinner, but reducing them due to dying all the time. However, this nuance is unfortunately offset by Mass Effect 3 and the plot's very clear bias towards the Genophage. They also do this with the Geth, but I may talk about that in another video. The game seems to kind of beat you over the head with the idea that the Krogan are the undisputed victims of the Genophage outside of comically evil characters like Erdnot Reeve making you, you know, hate them. This flies in the face of what we know about Mass Effect's lore and the nuance that was previously established in Mass Effect 1. In Mass Effect 3, characters like the Salarian Dalatras, who have a very clear objection to carrying the Genophage, are also treated as very evil. But, if I'm being perfectly honest, she kind of raises some super valid concerns. I won't apologize for speaking the truth. We uplifted the Krogan to do one thing, wage war. It's all they know because it's all we wanted them to know. Your people should have thought the matter through then. Was it really a surprise the Krogan revolted? That's precisely my point, Commander. We made a rash decision. We turned to the Krogan in desperation. It's the same mistake you're about to make today. Now, some people argue that curing the Genophage is the necessary decision so you can win the war. But this isn't true as the Krogans once again being able to have tons of babies does absolutely nothing for the war effort. I mean, they'd have to spend years raising those children for that to be viable. So the Krogan basically were using their soldiers and their fighting abilities as leverage for getting the Genophage cured. Now, some people see this as heroic. I personally see it like everything else involving the different species in Mass Effect 3 except for the Turians and their outrageous requests for Shepard, and that, uh, it is not the time. There is a galactic invasion and genocide in progress. You can wait. Now, I'm not going to say the Genophage was moral, because it wasn't. We see in Mass Effect 3 that the Genophage was only intended to be a deterrent initially by the Salarians, and the Turians deployed it as a massive retaliation. But I will defend this by pointing out that the Turians were already making their last stand during the Krogan Rebellions on the moon of Manet, only a decade into the war. And I'd wager that not only was the deploying of the Genophage a retaliation, but a justified or at least necessary one. The Krogans were regularly using asteroids to not only destroy Turian worlds, but make them uninhabitable. The Krogan were ruthless, and the use of the Genophage was much like the atomic bombs with Japan during World War II. But I'd argue this is even more justified than that. Like I said previously, the Turians were on their last stand early on in the war, and the Krogans would have just destroyed Palavin and moved on like they had time and time again. The Turians using the Genophage took away their enemy's most valued advantage, their ability to limitlessly replenish their numbers. Thus, I think the deployment of it as a biological weapon was justified and also necessary for the well-being of the galaxy, but we'll get to that in just a bit. And not to mention that even this didn't immediately stop the Krogan. The Genophage was deployed only a decade into the war, and the war continued for decades and decades afterwards. So, not only did it stem the Krogan tide, but it allowed the Turians to have a fighting chance. But discounting the war? The Krogan destroyed entire worlds and their ecologies irreparably just due to their population's extreme birth rate and lack of control over said population in the centuries leading up to the Krogan rebellions. It is stated that a single Krogan female can have a thousand children per year without the Genophage. That is an insanely high birth rate, but the Genophage is also stated to reduce the success of pregnancy and birth to about 1% of all Krogan pregnancies. Now, that sounds very bad, but that is actually quite sustainable and is actually stated to be pre-industrial levels of Krogan reproduction. ED even states that if just 1% of Krogan females were cured of the Genophage, 10 million Krogan children would be born the following year. Which, if my math is correct, that would be about 10,000 Krogan females that would have to be cured to reach that figure. Which, let's say there's about an equal number of female and male Krogans, that means there's about 2 million Krogan left. So, if about 1 million Krogan females are left, and 99% of pregnancies result in failures, that still leads the way for thousands of Krogan children to be born per year. That is far, far from ideal to be sure, but it sounds worse than it really is. With their insane lifespans, which can surpass even the Asari, this wouldn't be as much of an issue. Given that they can live for over a thousand years and be in pretty good health, that would mean that something like a year is not as significant as it is to a human. In a hundred years, they could replenish hundreds of thousands of Krogans. And in a thousand? Millions. This shows that if the Krogan were to stop fighting so intensely, they could slowly build up their population. But the Krogan are inherently violent. 
That's not to say certain Krogan don't overcome it, especially female Krogans as we see with Eve, but Grunt is even an example that they have a biological reason for being so violent. It's in their nature, and if I'm being honest, I don't think this will change even in a few generations with Rex and Eve as leaders. Just like with human nature, the Krogan are very warlike, but much worse than humans. The Krogans nuked themselves back to the Stone Age because of their violent nature, and they have not shown any indication of actually stemming this. Eve appeals to your emotions when traversing the ancient Krogan city, but this lacks the logical basis that we have. The Krogan are still split up amongst warring clans and are so violence-obsessed that they're destroying their species population through being mercenaries and bounty hunters. Forcing a species unprepared for technological advancement to suddenly become very advanced will always be a recipe for disaster. It would be like handing a loaded gun to an infant. Only bad things are going to happen, especially when considering their history of violence. It would have been healthier for the Krogan to advance themselves over the natural course of their evolution on their planet and change over time, but they were uplifted and used as a weapon against the Rachni. Though they are capable as warriors, their subsequent unchecked expansion after the end of the Rachni Wars showed what their arrogance and uninhibited natural prowess for violence was like in space given their uncivilized and primitive nature. Now, let's say for the sake of argument, they were not violent and were a very benevolent species. I don't think that is going to prevent them from having children and families and having unfettered population growth. Even if they aren't imperialist or expansionist or incredibly violent, they will have to expand out of necessity due to lack of resources and room to live in. Even if their government were to institute some form of population control, all it would take is for some Krogan renegades to go to another planet and, you know, plop out thousands of babies in a year to explode their population and you suddenly are right back at the source of the problem. The Krogans being violent is just part of the problem of uplifting them, but the real issue is their birth rate does not allow for unchecked space exploration without potential disaster. Now, you may say that morally it is wrong to deny an entire species what everyone else is allowed to do, but I'll just say that not all species are created equally, because they evolved in dramatically different conditions on planets light years apart from one another. They have different biological advantages and disadvantages. That may sound bad, but just look at the Volus. Do you think those guys can take on the horrors of the galaxy as well as anyone else can? I don't know. You decide. But no, denying an entire species their biological function is not morally or ethically right to do, but it is necessary for the well-being for the rest of the galaxy. The Krogan being allowed to expand with their pre-genophage birth rate only puts everyone else in the Krogan at risk. Even having controlled or supervised expansion of the Krogan by other galactic powers will inevitably lead to disaster in the long run whether it be Krogan renegades or war with the Krogan. So that is the dilemma. Either keep the Krogan quarantined to their own planet without modern technology and let them evolve and advance themselves, or let them expand but force a limiter on their population growth rate so that they don't end up causing a massive war and resource shortages because of said birth rate. I'll leave it to you guys to decide which is the correct decision or whether any of them are correct. One thing is for certain though. This issue is about what is logical or what will lead to the least conflict versus what is moral or ultimately right to do. I'm personally in the former camp, and I hope I've provided reasons as to why I feel this way and explained myself well enough. I'd also like to say that I don't think the Krogan are all bad, or that they deserve to suffer. No people deserve to pile up bodies of stillborns and go through immense amounts of miscarriages. These things undoubtedly led to the emotional turmoil and fatalistic attitude of much of the Krogan by the time of the Mass Effect games, and it really drives home the fact that the Krogan should have been left to themselves in the first place. This entire dilemma has come from that one decision to uplift them. But unfortunately, you cannot turn back time and now we're forced to make these hard decisions because, uh... Solarians. I am the very model of a scientist Solarian. I've studied species Turian, Asari, and Batarian. I'm quite good at genetics as a subset of biology because I am an expert which I know is a tautology. And one last thing I'd like to bring up is in regards to the math and the numbers of the Krogan. I know it makes no sense that there would only be 2 million Krogan left as they would pretty much be completely inconsequential in the fight against the Reapers if that were the case. 
I more so just based that off of the numbers given in game, and that just represents the huge scaling problem that Mass Effect has and the fact that it is horribly inconsistent. And to be honest, that's a pretty common problem in sci-fi. Anyways, I'm not sure how much more I can stretch out this video, so I'm going to leave my argument there and leave you all to dispute or agree with me in the comments if you so wish. I'll see you all in the next one when I talk about why I love Stannis Baratheon as a character and think he is not only the rightful king, but the best option for king in A Song of Ice and Fire. Where are my dragons? <laughs>